UFC Fight Night Columbus, Curtis Blades versus Chris Dawkins. Welcome to the prelim card prediction video by yours truly here at Boxing MMA Picks. He goes by Zahn, I go by Harris as usual. Fight by fight breakdowns and analysis from that betting perspective specifically. Here to let you know which fights are worth the value, which fights you want to avoid, which underdog has the best shot at winning and some parlay action towards the end. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit the thumbs up on this video. And most importantly, we want to hear from you in the comments. For this UFC Fight Night Columbus card, we have a total of 13 fights. We have seven of them on the prelims. So we're going to go ahead and get started right away with fight number one. Fight number one, we have Luis Saldana taking on Bruno Souza. For Luis Saldana, he lost to Austin Lingo back in August. Stands at range, switch stance fighter as well. Kind of methodical in his approach, you know, really picks his strikes very carefully. A good crisp calf kick, a lot of kicks in general. So look for a leg heavy attack from him. Has that good counter check hook to go along with it. Um, also got good head movement. Throws one, kind of throws one shot at a time. Also leaves the chin up a bit. Um, he does have some jujitsu, but doesn't really have any wrestling to go along with it. We see there zero uh, takedowns in the UFC thus far. He's going to definitely keep it on the feet. Um, despite his jujitsu ability, pressure is definitely a path to beating him. I think cardio might also be a concern for Luis Saldana. He's somebody that slows down after round one. He's taking on Bruno Souza, who lost to Melsic Bagdasarian. That was back in November. A karate style fighter. I think that was a short notice fight as well. Um, as we see, he uh, weighed over the featherweight limit there. A karate style fighter, solid striker. He has a good long jab, uh, decent movement, you know, especially going backward with that counter punch. Um, he's an evasive fighter. He moves very well laterally as well. Uh, I think he has good kicks. Uh, he has a BJJ brown belt, so has the grappling knowledge to go along with it. Doesn't really have the best takedown defense, though, um, even though I don't think Saldana would necessarily be able to take, uh, take advantage of that because I do think that this fight will stay on the feet. I think it'll be a striking match. Um, and, you know, very hard to score here in a lot of ways as they do offer somewhat similar strengths amongst them. I think the difference here is that I trust Bruno Souza's cardio more here. Um, you know, he looks the same in round three as he does in round one, whereas Luis Saldana, he looks a lot better in round one than he does in, in rounds two and three. A lot of his movement goes away. I think Souza will be a little bit trickier in this fight, a little bit more evasive. Um, I think you're looking at a split decision type of fight we see here the line get as close as a pick em. Um, From what I was seeing, Bruno Souza is a slight underdog. And especially at that slight underdog value, uh, I'm going to go with Bruno Souza here to, to get us started. Yeah, this is a, a really, really close fight uh, to start off the, the card here. Um, obviously, Bruno Souza, his first fight in the UFC, he fought a, he fought a, a really good fighter, a, a good striker in... Um, Melsic Bagasarian, and he looked pretty good in that fight. As the fight went on, as you indicated, his cardio held up, and um, it, it was pretty close, but he definitely lost that fight. Uh, Saldana, though, um, decent striker, active striker. I like his activity, um, but when he loses, uh, a lot of times um, they grapple him. Jordan Griffin had to grapple him, but he still won that fight, but I'm not sure he that was a kind of questionable uh, decision there, but fighters that can take him down have a lot of success and obviously Austin Lingo was was really tough in that fight he was kind of walking through sell down as uh punches um but in this fight I think it's a completely different fight they're both going to stand up here I think Saldana's um activity is going to win the fight here I think just being the more active fighter Bruno uh, Bruno Souza to me is an inactive fighter and Saldana has fought in guys with 20 30 fight experience uh, fights under under their belt when you look at Bruno Souza's uh, fighter season face, everyone uh, has under like 10 fights. I'm sorry, not under 10 fights, but a lot less. The most uh, fights a guy had was 14 fights. Uh, and when you look at Saldana, he's fought a, he's fought a guy that had, uh, let me check here, 50 fights, uh, I'm sorry, 48 fights. Another guy with 50 fights, 49 fights, uh, 26 fights with Jordan Griffin. So he's definitely the more, uh, he's fought in the more experienced guys. Uh, he's been there. I'm going to pick him to win this fight. It's a close fight. I can't really, um, I don't have much intel to kind of sway me to either side other than I think that Saldana is going to be the, the more active striker. 
And I think in a close fight like this, that could be enough to, to, win, a, to win a decision here. All right, let's move on to fight number two. We have Mateus Nicolau taking on David Dvorak. Um, Mateus Nicolau, he beat Tim Elliott back in October. Good patient movement, good calf kick, a good jab to maintain the distance. Uh, I think he's a pretty effective striker, you know, good at picking his shots, good counter puncher as well. Uh, he will shoot for that single. We see that, uh, you know, he does have decent takedowns in, de in general, at least based on the numbers, almost two takedowns a fight, um, you know, almost 50% on the accuracy side of things. So he's one of those people that are pretty solid on the feet and pretty, uh, pretty decent with the wrestling as well. David Dvorak, on the other hand, he's on a 16 fight win streak, uh, including three and zero in the UFC. He beat Juan Camilo Ronderos back in May. I, I like his stand-up, you know, good setups, good calf kicks, um, good counter puncher as well. He takes his time on the feet to really, you know, read the opponent and, and read their timing. He has good head movement. He has good striking defense. Um, he has a good pace about him, and he's a pretty high IQ fighter. Um, you know, looks like he's worked on his takedown defense. Um, you know, looks like he's worked on his offensive grappling as well. Um, look for him to keep it on the feet, but again, looks like he's worked on his takedown defense, at least based on his, his last fight, if I remember correctly. Um, but looking at this fight, you know, good fight for sure. I think both guys are capable on the feet, but I do think David Dvorak is at a higher level. I think he's a bit more technically sound. Uh, of course, Nikolaus takedowns can be a great equalizer here. Um, like I said, you know, he lands almost two, two per fight. But I think Dvorak's improved takedown defense will be a big factor here in this fight. You know, Nicolau may be able to land the takedown in the first round, but I don't think he'll get it, you know, deep into the second round. I don't think he'll get it in the third round. Um, and in those second and third rounds, I think that's when David Dvorak will start to take over in terms of him having the, the sharper striking. Um, so, you know, I'm looking at a 29-28 unanimous decision type of fight here. Uh, Mateus Nicolau is tough, but my pick is going to be uh, David Dvorak. Yeah, this is a, a tough fight. Reminds me of last week, Jack Shore, Valley. Uh, they're pitting uh, two guys um, that have really good potential against each other. Um, obviously, uh, Nicolau has some good wins uh, in the UFC recently. Uh, Dvorak uh, has been looking good as well. Uh, Nikolai is very well-rounded. I think he might be the more well-rounded guy he might have the wrestling advantage. He has that jujitsu. Um, he can strike as well. Um, but I've seen Dvorak um, be w really good with the footwork, and he has really good feints in the striking. It's going to be hard to get him to the mat. He does have jujitsu as well. He does have grappling, so he can definitely hold his own in that area. Uh, I think this fight's going to be mainly standing up because of Dvorak's takedown defense. Um, and I, when it comes to the stand-up, I think Dvorak, the activity is going to be too much, the movement as the fight goes on, but I think Nicolau can land a shot. He's a, a sharp striker that I think if he lands, he could put David Dvorak out. Um, but over three rounds, I think David Dvorak's gonna pick it up, uh, land land the better strikes, um, use those feints, uh, get good looks here and win a decision. So I'm gonna go David Dvorak in, in, a, in a tough fight, but I think, he, I think he can get it done. Fight number three, Jennifer Maya taking on Manon Furo. Uh, can't believe this one's not on the main card, but uh, fight number three for the prelim. Jennifer Maya lost to Caitlin Chukagian back in January, so she's getting back in there right away. Decent boxing technique. She has good hands, good power too. Uh, very comfortable on the feet. Physically strong as well. She has a good clinch game. Um, good active usage of knees in the clinch as well. Uh, good ground game as well. You know, decent top control. We see she's not going to actively wrestle and get you down to the ground only you know 0.25 takedowns per fight but if she does end up on top again you know good good control on top active enough in the ground and pound um if you take her down she's pretty active on her back as well she'll uh, you know attempt submissions um she'll she'll kind of stay out of danger in a lot of ways um but that said i don't really think she has the best takedown defense which could be a huge issue in this match specifically uh, her cardio does hold up, though, so that, that's definitely important to mention. Manon Furo beat uh, Myra Bueno Silva back in October. She's 3-0 and in the UFC now. Uh, she's a southpaw karate-style fighter, very dynamic striker on the feet, very tricky movement, you know, shuffle kicks, side kicks, uh, combinations, uh, things like that. You know, she has almost that 
sort of Wonder Boy-like movement about her um, in, in, in some ways. Um, she moves very well laterally, very hard target to hit, a strong clinch, she has good takedowns as well. She's, we see that she lands almost two per fight. Uh, top control is pretty solid. And, um, you know, she can definitely keep you on the ground with improving position, good grappler as well to go along with it. Um, you know, she's somebody who, you know, again, is, is a legitimate contender, um, you know, in this flyweight division and, uh, you know, looking to continue her win streak in the UFC. I think this could be a good win on her resume. Um, I do think she is the better overall striker in this matchup against Jennifer Maya. Um, of course, she has more activity. I think that's the key thing. And I think Maya's a weak takedown defense is going to be a key factor in this fight, like I mentioned. I wouldn't be surprised if the fight goes in a lot of ways uh, the, the same way that Manon Feroz's last fight went, again, against uh, Myra Bueno Silva. I can see, you know, Maya being the aggressor the way Bueno Silva was. I can see Furo using her kicks to keep distance the way she did in that fight. And I can see Furo, um, you know, looking for the takedown when she needs to secure a round in, in what could be close rounds on the feet where Maya has the power advantage. Um, so I think, again, Firo just offers more in this fight. Um, I can see why she's a big favorite. Um, I wish it was a little bit lower, but I definitely like Man and Firo in this spot. Yeah, I think Man and Firo's going to put her away here. I think she's going to make easy work in this fight. Maya doesn't go for takedowns. She has maybe one or two takedowns in her whole UFC career. And that's going to be big in this fight. I think for her to win this fight, she needs to use that high-class jiu-jitsu, get this to the mat, play jiu-jitsu against Man, and that, that's her best. I think that's her only way to win this fight. Um, but I see Man Fro with her physicality, her strength, keeping this on the feet, and I, I think she's the far better striker. So I'm going to go Man and Ferro here to win a, a clear, clear win here um, in this fight. Fight number four, Aliakshab Kizirev taking on Dennis. Tulin. Um, for Kizriev, he hasn't fought since September 2020. That was on Dana White Contender Series. Um, you know, he's a Dagestani wrestler. Expect him to have that smothering style of wrestling, of course. Nasty ground and pound. Good takedown defense as well to go along with it. And on the feet, his striking is clean. You know, good kickboxing ability. Uh, he's a southpaw on the feet. He's light on his feet. Um, pretty good prospect here. And I think he's 30 years old as well. So, um, you know, in kind of that athletic prime where you expect him to kind of perform rather than being too young for the sport, as an example. Um, he's taking on, again, uh, Dennis Tiulin. Um, it's his UFC debut as well. He last competed, um, I think, uh, all the way last year, March 2021. A good striker, you know, expect him to control the center of the octagon. He's primarily a boxer from what I've seen. Um, he has good power. Eight of his 10 wins are via KO, TKO. So that's something that Kizriev is definitely going to have to be weary of. Uh, my first impression of Dennis is that he looks a little bit basic. Um, you know, he might be more dangerous on the feet, but he isn't really a high activity or a high pace striker. And I think that's where Kizriev's movement will kind of allow him to avoid the danger there. Um, although Dennis is, is Russian, I don't really see any wrestling out of him either outside of, you know, fighting uh, the, 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 those takedown attempts, so showing his takedown defense. Um, but I'll keep it short. I like Kizriev here. Uh, I think his stand-up is more dynamic. I feel he'll have the much more advantageous strategy as well as somebody who will actively go for that takedown. Um, and if you kind of want some intel or some insight, watch Dennis Tulin taking on uh, Ikram Aliskarov. That was back in 2020 to get an idea of how Tudulin will perform against that Dagestani uh, Russian wrestling style who's going to actively go for takedowns. Um, so again, I can see why Kizriev is the big favorite here, but you always want to caution with two newcomers to the UFC. In some ways, you don't know what's going to happen. So this might be a little bit too steep, but if we're analyzing the fighters and we're analyzing the fight, this should be uh, no problem for Aliak Shab Kizriev. So he's going to be my pick. Yeah, I think Dennis is a, a short notice replacement guy here. Um, what I looked at some fights of his, he has some, he's pretty dangerous on the feet. I think he can definitely, uh, if he lands that shot, can put Kizriev out. Uh, but Kizriev has that, that grappling. And I've seen Dennis taken down and controlled. Um, so I see Kizriev 
going back to that grappling, he has really high level uh, wrestling, uh, getting on top. And I don't think Dennis is going to have a clue what to do there. And I see him eventually getting the finish here in this fight. Uh, so, yeah, I like Kizri over here to get it done. And I'm pretty, uh, pretty confident here. This guy's a, he's a stud in the ring. He has really good wrestling. Dennis is not going to have an answer for it. And I can see Kizri up getting that submission. Fight number five, Chris Gutierrez taking on Bakary Dana. Um, for Bakary Dana, he's on a three-fight win streak, all of them being uh, round one TKOs. Pretty impressive there. Uh, he beat Brandon Davis back in October. Good fluid movement on the feet as a kickboxer. He has you know, good hands as well, good lateral movement. I like his fakes, his feints, um, his distance control, his leg kicks. And I really like his combinations. You know, He's somebody who's pretty uh, technically sound. He has a good, diverse striking skill set as well. Um, and you got to respect his power. Um, you know, seven of his wins are via KO, TKO. Um, so definitely got to respect that. He does get hit at times, you know, especially if you can put that pressure on him. Um, but, you know, sneaky takedowns. I know you look at the number there, you see zero takedowns. He hasn't landed any in four UFC fights. Um, but prior to getting to the UFC, I have seen him show a sneaky takedown or two. Uh, so I'm curious to see if that will happen in this fight. He's taking on Chris Gutierrez, who had a split decision win over Felipe Calares back in October as well. Uh, he's unbeaten in his last six fights, all of those being in the UFC. So that's pretty impressive. A high-level striker, uh, has you know high striking IQ, you know, picks his spots really well. Of course, we know he has that dangerous calf kick, um, one of the best in the UFC at using it definitely nullifies pretty much all the opponents that he faces with it. He does switch stance a lot. He's pretty light on his feet. You know, he'll use a lot of fakes, good ability to control the center of the octagon. So that always looks good in the eyes of the judges. And he's, uh, you know, definitely much more likely to keep the fight on the feet. Um, although, you know, you, you see the number there at half a takedown per fight, he's definitely going to keep it on the feet. I think uh, Batgari Dana is going to keep it on the feet as well. Um, but I think Dana will be able to kind of minimize the effectiveness of Gutierrez's calf kick. I think he'll do that with his movement. He does have some pretty good movement. I think he'll, he'll check the kick themselves or he'll just show his good movement or with the pressure that he puts on, um, he'll kind of stop Chris Gutierrez from using it. Um, I think about Gutierrez's last fight versus Felipe Calares where Calares was able to do a lot of those things, kind of put the pressure on him, hence Gutierrez getting a split decision win as opposed to a unanimous decision win. The difference here is that I think that Gary Dana has better hands than Felipe Calares. He hits harder than Felipe Calares. So whereas Calares was able to make it a split decision win for Gutierrez, I think Dana is going to be able to do enough to get a win for himself. Um, so I'm going to go back Gary Dana here, um, you know, close decision. I can see why he's a close favorite here. Uh, he's going to be my pick. Yeah, to me, this is a 50-50 fight here. Um, Dana Backer has been looking good been knocking everybody out. Um, but when you really look at Chris Gutierrez, this guy has been looking clean in his fighting. And he has really good striking. He has those leg kicks. He can beat anyone in a striking match. And in this fight, this, this likely could be a kickboxing match if, they, if this stays on the feet. And I think he can beat anyone in that type of match here. So to me, this is a tough fight uh, because, it, because it's a short notice fight, I believe, for Chris Gutierrez. Um, I think it's going to be a bit harder to do that over three rounds. And um, Dana Baccarell, he's going to have to close the distance uh, with kicks. Like people that like to kick, you got to close the distance on them. If you, if you look at that fight with Giga, Chikadze, and uh, Calvin Cater, and Dana Baccarell can close the distance. So he can kind of do what, um, uh, what's that guy's name? K, what's his name again? Um, I just said his name. Did against uh, Giga Chikadze. So um, in that Qatar, Calvin, is it Calvin Qatar? So like Calvin Qatar had that box and he had to keep that close distance with the kicker and Giga. And I think that's how you kind of beat a kicker is that you got to stay up close on them. You got to put on that pressure. Don't give him that room to, to do a lot of those kicks. And I think Dana can do that. So I'm going to go Dana here because he, um, it's, it's not a short notice fight for him. In a close fight, I think that could make a difference in this fight. Uh, plus he has that power. Um, I can see him dropping Chris. I can see him putting him down. Usually when you knock someone down, you win the round. So um, I like Dana in this spot, but again, this is this is tough. I think 
If they fought 10 times, I think each fighter would win around five each. So, uh, but I'm going to go Dana Baccarel for the channel, but I think it is a, a tough fight. Sixth fight of this prelim card, we have Sarah McMahon versus Carol Hosa. Uh, for Sarah McMahon, it's been over a year since her last fight. She lost to Juliana Pena back in January 2021. Uh, we know she wants to bring the fight to the ground. She'll level change. She'll look for the single. She will complete the takedown. Um, you know, good top control, good ability to improve position, to smother, and sort of to win the round from there. She has strong grappling and strong chain wrestling. Um, you know, serviceable stand-up, although, you know, she will usually be at the disadvantage, as she will in this fight. Um, you know, her feet are flat. Her, her movement isn't amazing. Her striking defense is okay at times, but that's something that could be an issue. Otherwise, I mean, again, look for a lot of fakes and feints from her as she tries to set up that takedown. Um, the, the ground game is definitely where she wants to thrive. She's taking on Carol Hosa, who I believe is a much more well-rounded fighter. Um, Hosa's on a six-fight win streak. She beat uh, Beth Cohea back in October. Um, solid stand-up. She has that Muay Thai style, stays in the pocket, which I really like about her striking. Um, uses a solid jab, has a pretty solid calf kick as well. She can strike first, or she can kind of play that counter-striker role um, really up to her. And she can put really good combinations together as well. She does have a ground game in her own right. Uh, we see she averages a takedown and a half per fight. Um, you know, she'll shoot for that double leg. Sorry, at 50% accuracy on top of that. Um, you know, she'll shoot for the double leg. She'll land it pretty effectively. Um, she's solid on top. She, she has pretty uh, active uh, striking in terms of, you know, the, the head body strikes, um, kind of going with the ground and pound, kind of keeping it active, not really allowing the referee to stand them back up. Um, you know, good elbows as well in her ground and pound. Um, has a solid clinch to go along with it. You know, she can kind of play the control and keep you against the cage type of game as well. She's pretty physically strong for this bantamweight division. Um, you know, Carol Hosa has especially good ring control. Um, I think she has the much better striking. And I think she has the strength and the ability to wrestle enough to, you know, limit McMahon's advant or potential advantages there. Uh, although McMahon, again, may be the better wrestler I think, simply put, this is a very bad matchup for her. Um, I thought Carajosa would be probably a minus 300, to be completely honest with you, um, also considering Sarah McMahon's age. Um, Carajosa is in her athletic prime. Sarah McMahon's in her 40s. Um, I'm going to go with the person in their athletic prime almost every single time. So Carajosa, a better overall fighter in her athletic prime, taking on someone who's definitely on the decline. Uh, it seems like the obvious pick. Uh, especially at minus 220 pretty good odds there yeah i think this is uh closer uh, than the odds indicate i think this is a spot sarah mcmahon can show out um in a lot of her fights she gets these fighters to the mat and um these fighters eventually submit her on the mat juliana pena was um was losing that fight she lost the first two rounds and was able to get a submission in the third round um marion renault was able to get a triangle choke in the second round so these are fighters she took to the mat um and either they turned it around as the fight went on or they caught her in a submission while on the mat. So a lot of these fighters, uh, they have that grappling, that submission background that when Sarah goes into that grappling realm with the wrestling, they eventually can catch her slipping. Carol Rosa to me doesn't have that, that submission jujitsu that, that these fighters have, in my opinion. So I think this could be a tough fight for her. I think if Sarah McMahon comes out, she's going to have one, two rounds. And she always has at least a good one, two rounds or one round and a half, she gets um, Carol Rosa to, to the mat and grinds out that first round. And if she can get her down in the second round, it's, it's not looking good for Carol. Um, so that's one way the fight can go. And then Carol comes on in the third round, but it's kind of a bit too late. Or Sarah gets her down that first round. Then as the fight goes on, second, third round, she can get the takedowns. And Carol is far better than um, Sarah McMahon in the, uh, the striking. So she would definitely uh, get a lot of points there. So I want to make it quick. I'm going to go Carol Rosa. But again, I think this is tough because Sarah McMahon is an um, um, Olympic uh, wrestler. She's a, She won silver medal, I believe, in wrestling. So she's not a joke with that wrestling. And she she was beating Juliana Pena with that wrestling, who's the champion now. And then obviously in the third round, she got submitted, but she was winning that fight. So um yeah, it's tough, but I'm going to go Carol Rosa. She's the younger girl. Uh, she has shown some good takedown defense, albeit against weaker wrestlers. 
Um, but I think she, she could have enough here to at least limit the damage in the first round and come on in the second and third round. So I'm going to go Kara Rosa to win the fight. But yeah, I think it, I think it could get sticky because she doesn't, I don't think she has that submission threat that the, uh, the other fighters used against uh, Sarah. But I'm going to go Kara to get the win. All right, let's move on to the final fight of our prelims. We have Neil Magny versus Max Griffin. Uh, Neil Magny beat Jeff Neal back in May. A well-rounded fighter. He can do a bit of everything. He's, you know, he's a long, rangy striker in the stand-up. Uh, we see he's going to have four inches in reach, four inches in height as well. He has a really long jab. He's light on his feet. He uses kicks effectively to keep range as well. A uh, decent overall ground game, although I wouldn't really say it's, it's dominant in any way. Um, good takedown numbers, though. Two and a half takedowns per fight, just over 40% accuracy. He has a you know respectable takedown defense to go along with it, but it's mainly him using his length to his advantage. Uh, and you know, can't really forget to mention that his cardio is, is is fantastic. You know, he keeps it up with his constant activity. That's something that he can keep up, especially for a three round fight. Uh, he's taking on Max Griffin, like I mentioned. He's on a three fight win streak, um, beating Carlos Condit back in July. Decent and uh, improved stand up, I'll say. Uh, you know, moves pretty decently around the cage, a lot of change of directions, a lot of in and out. Uh, he'll jab actively. Uh, he'll effectively, you know, use those calf kicks. I see that's something he's implementing into his game more. Um, he looked more technically sound on the feet in his last couple of fights, but I will still say his striking overall lacks um, some technique, although again, improving. He is moving at all times. So that's something that you have to give him. His cardio doesn't really seem to be a problem with him either. Um, he can sort of press forward. He can initiate when he chooses to. But we kind of know him as a wrestler first. Um, you know, just over one and a half takedowns per fight, over 50% accuracy. He has good takedowns. He has good top control. Um, he has good takedown defense as well. Uh, this is definitely a step up in competition for Griffin, a step down in competition for Neil Magny. Um, Griffin might be the better wrestler here, but I don't think he'll be able to use that for three rounds. Picking <coughs> up on it, um, Magny also, of course, will have that the good height and reach advantage. I think he will be able to effectively use that in his favor. I also think his striking, you know, even without those advantages, is simply cleaner um, technically. You can't really feel confident in either fighter from a betting perspective, so I will immediately caution i won't be betting on this i won't suggest betting on this um you know magni might be on the decline he is 34 years old at this point um and although griffin striking is improving he's still a 36 year old fighter so these are two fighters that are uh you know maybe i should say technically on the decline um but basically i'm going to trust neil magni more a bit in the spot you know he finds ways to win fights um he's been in the bigger fights although he might lose round one I think he'll know what to do in the second and in the third to win a 29-28 unanimous decision type of thing. Um, I might consider parlay piecing this, you know, maybe come uh, come weigh-ins or come face-offs. Um, but until then, I'm, I'm raising a cautionary flag here. I wouldn't bet at all, but I will pick Neil Magny. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a good fight here. Uh, both guys well-rounded. Uh, Max Griffin again. He's been looking good his last couple fights, um, but he's a he's a type of fighter I think um, against a guy like Magny. He's gonna have to show out in that first round. Uh, I think he's gonna he's gonna have that first round to kind of uh, put the damage on Magny that can kind of dictate where the fight goes uh, for the rest of the way. Because I see Magny as the fight goes, he he puts up a, a ridiculous pace. Um, I think they both have good cardio, but I just see that Magny when you get to the second third round. He's actually throwing more strikes than he was throwing in the first round. And he's going to have a four-inch uh, height advantage, four-inch reach advantage. I'm going to go with Magny here. Um, but again, that first round for me is, is a bit concerning. Um, but Magny has shown that he is pretty tough. But, and, I, and as the fight goes on, I think Magny's just going to put on a pace, just outstrike him for the rest of the fight. Uh, maybe get some takedowns and um, some clinch work. He has some really good clinch work here. So... I like Magny in the spot, utilize uh, his experience here and uh, obviously the height advantage that he has. And But the big thing for me is his cardio, his pace. As the fight goes on, he's, he's, he's really throwing those strikes at a high rate. So I'm going to go Neil Magny. To, he should get it done. Neil Magny is my pick. 
All right, let's take it to Vegas. Let's um, consider just a prelim card, of course. And let's start with some potential underdogs. Underdogs in this situation being Bruno Souza, Mateus Nicolau, um, Jennifer Maya, uh, Dennis Tululin, Chris Gutierrez, Sarah McMahon, and Max Griffin. Um, which underdog do you think has the best shot at winning? One sec here. Okay. So Dan is not a pick of no more, eh? So he's a, he's a favorite now. Yes. Uh, Bruno Souza did open up as an underdog as well, in addition to that. Okay. Yeah, I don't like any of these underdogs here. Nope, fair enough. Fair enough. Always got to mention when we uh, skip an underdog pick, I think that's just as important as trying to pick one. Um, in terms of my underdog pick, of course, we are referring to the same fight. I'm going with Bruno Souza. Again, minor underdog in this one. He's even money plus 100. Um, in terms of favorite picks or parlay pieces, what are you taking a look at? Uh, I'm going to roll with uh, Kizriev, Manin Faro, and uh, Carol Rosa. Carol Rosa. There we go. So those three fights would be a plus 114. $100 will return 214 for our bigger betters. $250 will return 535. And uh, again, it's always a good sign when we coincidentally have the same favorite picks. Um, I think those would be the three, car the three fights that I'm really looking at on this prelim card. Um, again, Kizriev, Manon Furo and Carol Hosa. And again, at a plus 114, $100 will get you 214, $250 will get you 535. So let's sign off there. Of course, we were giving you the prelim card prediction video for UFC Fight Night Columbus, Curtis Blades versus Chris Dawkins. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit the thumbs up on this video. And most importantly, we want to hear from you in the comments. Let us know how you feel about our picks. Let us know what your pick of the under uh, of, of the prelim card or parlay pieces that you're considering. And of course, if you want additional insight and analysis, let that be known in the comments. And we're more than happy to have the discussion with you there as well. But officially signing off for UFC Fight Night, Curtis Blades versus Chris Dawkins. We are boxing MMA picks. He goes by the name of Zahn. I go by the name of Harris. And as usual, let's get this money. Let's get it.